The fifth thing I'd like to discuss with you is uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. I put this little quotation right here. It's actually, um, it's actually on a t-shirt that I have. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of thinkgeek.com, uh, but it's a, a good website where you can find all sorts of nerdy things. Um, I've got a t-shirt uh, that says, I am uncertain about quantum mechanics. I also have another one that says, you know, obey gravity, it's the law. So there's all sorts of funny things there. But uh, I just thought that was actually kind of funny and you'll see why in a second. Uh, so Heisenberg's uncertainty principle uh, mentioned and, and talked about uh, the fact that, well, actually first I'll just give you the equation. This is on your data booklet. So delta P delta X uh, is greater than or equal to H over 4 pi. And it turns out we also have uh, delta, uh, we'll have uh, energy and time. So in this case it'll be delta E delta T is also greater than H over 4 pi. Now what this tells you though is delta x is the uncertainty on position so, and delta uh, p is the uncertainty on momentum which actually contains a term you know about speed. And remember momentum p equals mv. And of course, h is just a constant, and then 4 pi. By the way, delta E is energy. Uh, that's the uncertainty on energy. Delta T is the uncertainty on time. What this basically tells us, this is actually really fundamental and pretty mind-blowing as well. On exams, they don't tend to ask you much about these, um, except to explain what it means. And that's why, uh, I mean, the equations are not always used uh, to ask you to do some calculations, but they, I've seen before where they ask you to explain what it means. And here's the key thing. Uh, this actually changed our understanding of, well, everything. We used to think that if we only knew all the starting conditions, uh, this is called determinism. If we, if we just knew all the starting conditions, then we could predict what's going to happen. And what this basically says is, nope, it doesn't matter how good you are, it doesn't matter how much you can predict at the beginning, there's uncertainty in everything. There's uncertainty in something's position, and there's uncertainty in its momentum, and therefore in its speed. So what this tells you is, um, that you can know a particle's position really well, but then you won't know anything about its speed, or you can know its speed really well, and then you won't know anything about its position, or you could go a sort of middle ground between the two. You could know each of them sort of well. Right, this is really what it kind of tells you here. And that is key. What this really means then is uh, the universe is more about probabilities than anything. It's just about calculating what's the probability of finding something where you're looking for it. There's no for sure. So even if you think it's going to be there, it may not be. So quantum mechanics basically, and especially Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, is really sneaky. It says that things can be in places you don't expect them, things don't always behave the way you want them. So all we can do, the best we can do, is to calculate probabilities and say, well, the probability is something of this happening. Maybe the probability is really, really high, so it's likely to happen, but there's always a chance it won't. There's no 100%. Uh, and this is actually quite um, a big leap of faith. I guess it's a, it's a big uh, paradigm shift that we used to think, you know, determinism, great. If you only knew all the conditions, you can always predict. But Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says, nope, doesn't matter how good you are. You can predict probabilities, but that's as good as you can do. You'll never know for sure what happens. Um, remember, Einstein actually uh, hated this. Um, I remember he had a, a famous quote where he talked about how uh, he doesn't believe that God plays dice. In other words, you know, he doesn't believe that God sort of rolls the dice and sees what's the probability of this. And in quantum mechanics, it seems to show that not only does God play dice, he plays it all the time on everything. It seems he has a, a weird um, sense of humor. So uh, quantum mechanics and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle go very well hand in hand. And actually, uh, here's a joke. Um, not that many people have heard it. I can tell you that if you tell this joke to a physicist, they'll usually howl with laughter. Um, so here it is. Now you have to know about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Remember, you can know something's position or its speed, but not both. Really, really short joke. Heisenberg's driving in his car. He gets pulled over for speeding. The police officer says, any idea how fast you were going? And he says, no, but I know exactly where I am. Ah, ha, ha. 
Um, so at least that's a little bit about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. We're not expected to do much complicated calculations here, it's just this. Uh, then we switch tracks now. Remember this topic was called quantum and nuclear physics. Remember, not nuclear, as uh, people like George Bush liked to say. Uh, it's nuclear physics, because we're all about looking at the nucleus of an atom, right? The center of it. So nuclear physics, in this case, we're going to talk about decay. And just a little blast from the past, from what we've done before. Um, remember that we had something called T1 half, and that was the time it takes to have half. Uh, maybe that's awkward, actually, the way I've done it. To have 1 half the original say mass, or it could also be the original number of particles. Uh, so that's the key thing going on here, is that it's the time it takes to have half the original mass. Uh, so we saw in a previous topic that decay is a random process. What that means is that you can't know exactly um, when a particle will go through radioactive decay. Remember, that's when it just becomes something else. Some people call it uh, transmutation. Right, so one element can just become another one plus other stuff. Remember we talked about alpha decay and beta positive decay, beta minus decay, and gamma. Gamma, though, isn't very exciting. That's just a photon. It's a, just a high-energy photon. So that didn't really do much. But we were looking at alpha particles. Remember, alphas were uh, a helium-4. Remember, that's what an alpha particle was. It was just a helium-4. Remember we had beta, and we had beta minus, which is actually an electron. This is an electron here, and you always got these extra little particles. These antineutrinos came with them, and we had beta plus, so to speak. In other words, positron uh, beta decay, uh, and that came with regular neutrinos. What was really cool about this, though, is that um, an electron and a positron are antimatter of each other. And that means that if an electron and a positron sort of, if they're charging along and then they meet, if they meet, they'll actually disappear, they will annihilate, and you'll just get light. And it turns out that, uh, so you'll get gamma rays usually, and they'll usually be like at angles like this. And it turns out that light can actually come by, so two photons can come along, do, 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 and they can make two particles. So that's called pair production. But that's pretty cool, I think. But when we look at decay, uh, what we can do is through these different processes, either alpha or beta minus or beta plus, in other words, electron beta or positron beta decay, we can have some number of particles, or maybe this is the mass. This is going to represent time. Sometimes uh, time is measured in seconds. It could be in years. I've seen it in weeks and months and days. So this is not necessarily fixed to just seconds. Okay? This time can sometimes have weird units on it. And this here, this is your number of particles or your mass. And what we do is uh, we take a look, and at some uh, point in time, at time t equals zero, we have 100% of it. And then what happens, of course, is it goes down. It's exponential decay. That means it, get in, it gets infinitely close there to the edge without actually reaching it. It's, it's asymptotic to this. Uh, and what happens then is that at some point in time, it takes a certain time to get exactly half the original amount. So if I look at this and go down, that is t one half. And if I do another half life, all right, then I can go like this right here, and I can see well that's two times t one half, and so on. So each time I have a half life, I have exactly half the original mass that I had. So if I start off with 500 grams of a material. After one half-life, I have 250 grams. After another half-life, I have 125, and so on, and so on, and so on. So you can just count up these things. Now, this is basically a quick review of what we did in the SL stuff, but uh, we're going to, in the next video, do some of the HL stuff. But I figured it would help to just know what we're talking about here. So in the next video, we're going to look at half-life and decay constant and do a, a really important derivation.